Today's message, there's so many scriptures we could, we could go through. There's only time for so many. There's so many that are special to each and every one of us on this subject that we're going to go through today. But I want to start off with some questions, and I don't want any answers. Just, just answer yourself in your thoughts. How many of you that are hearing this message feel that they are loved? How many really feel loved? Do you feel loved? We have many relationships in our lives. Our parents, our spouses, our children, our grandchildren, our friends, our family, brothers, sisters, neighbors. Do you feel loved? How many do you love in your life? And by what measurement do you measure that love? There are many people, so many people in this world who are alone or lonely, feel that they do not have anyone. Some come to a point in their life they don't feel they have anything to even live for. And it's so sad that someone's life comes to that point. It's a major tragedy. It's not something that God intended. They feel an emptiness. There are some that have been multi-millionaires that have taken their life because they were alone. They were lonely. And they felt they had nothing in this life. Money and things cannot buy you happiness. They cannot buy you love. Love is something that is freely given because someone cares for another. I want you to think about the people in your life that you love for a moment. How many would you give your life for? Give your very last breath for, that you would take a bullet for, for lack of a better term or jump in front of a car to save their life, or whatever the situation may be. Would you be willing to give your life for a stranger? And I mean seriously, give your life. How about an enemy? Now, God's people are not supposed to have enemies, right? We're not supposed to bear grudges or hard feelings or have hatred in our heart. So I've got a different way of putting it. Because we're even told we're to bless those who curse us. How about ISIS? Mark had brought them up in his message. They hate Christians. Would you give your life for a member of ISIS? And I'm not talking about standing up for Christianity and giving your life that way. I'm talking about to save their life. If something was happening that they were going to die, would you put your life on the line to save them? These are hard questions. And when we really think about them, they're really hard. For God so loved the world, a people that hate Him, a people that are a natural enemy of Him, that He gave His only begotten Son. People that live, and I'm talking, I'm not putting anyone down, but Mankind is naturally an enemy of God. Read Romans 8. Refresh yourself with it. Without the Spirit of Almighty God, mankind is an enemy to God. And there's some worse than others, but sin is sin. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever commits his life to Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That through him they might be saved. The ones that talk against him, that do whatever you can think of contrary to God's way and thumb their noses at God. There is no God. And they mock and they joke and they laugh. And brethren, there are some that seriously do. Jesus Christ gave his life for everyone. God the Father sacrificed and allowed his Son. You think about that. That's a lot to take in because wouldn't the natural thing be that I'll do it? That had to have been so hard on the Father. To know he had all power and to sit back and allow all the things that happened to his son before his face. Those that hated and spat upon him and beat him and ridiculed him and took his very life. Romans 5, a few verses in Romans 5, starting in verse 6 says, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. And there have been people that have given their lives. They've given their lives to save another individual. I've told this story when I was a young man and our house was a fire. And my mom got me out. She pulled me to the floor and we crawled to the door because you couldn't see. It was black. And we got outside and my two-year-old brother laid in his bed behind the storm glass windows. And my mom couldn't breathe and they're resuscitating her on the hill. And how a man, a stranger, walking down the street, come running up, and he heard my mom say, my baby's in there. And he took his arm and put it right through that storm glass windows, and he got him out. The fire was too hot for even the fire department to get inside. That man had a hundred, and I don't remember how many stitches. He didn't know my mom. He didn't know my brother. But it was more important to save someone else. And he could have lost his life. And there's been many that have lost their lives. And you hear of stories of people drowning and how someone goes in and saves them, but yet they end up drowning. There's so many. Noble acts. Acts of love. That is love. That's true love. Yet perhaps a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were unfruitful, while we were an enemy, while we were following after Satan, the ways of the world is what I'm talking about. Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. We are saved, brethren. We have so much to be happy about, to be filled with joy, because that death penalty does not, it's not on you. You've been forgiven. You're under the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Just as the blood was put for that lamb upon the lintels in the doorpost, and the death angel passed over, just as death will pass us over if the blood of Jesus Christ is upon us. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to be filled with joy because we have a hope. Verse 10 says, For if then we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And we've 
talked about those scriptures in Hebrews, how Christ is our mediator and our high priest, and how he understands the things we go through because he went through them. He felt them. He overcame them. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You have been reconciled to the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. Brethren, the reason I ask those questions at the beginning, I don't think we really understand, we really grasp the depth of the love that God has for each and every one of you. It's personal, it's individual, and as a whole, God loves you. He loves you so much, He gave His Son for you and for all of mankind. Do this. I want you to place your name in this when I read this. For God so loved, put your name there, that He gave His only begotten Son to die and to give you life, to justify you, to sanctify you. Because it's that personal. We think about the whole world, and He did for the whole world. I don't take away from that, but we have to think about personally, right down to each and every one of us. All who will hear this, all who will hear when God calls them, he died for each and every one. He died for you. And that, brethren, is how much God loves you. What more can He give? What more does He have to give than to give the very life? A precious life of a righteous man. If you would turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, starting in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Simple as that. You want to know the greatest gift? It's the laying down of one's life for someone else. That's all you have to give. You can't give more than your life. Jesus Christ couldn't give more than His very life, His shed blood. And it was more than that stake, brethren. That sacrifice began the night before when He was on His knees before His Father and said, as He felt, He was human, and He felt what was coming. And that human nature calling out, if there's a way to pass this cup, Father, not my will, but thy will. God has already given each one of us the greatest gift, his life. Well, who is this Savior? Who is this Savior that there's almost 300 prophecies about in the Scriptures? There's not time to go through them today. You know many of them just from your memory. Let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. A couple of verses here. Let's refresh ourselves with who this Savior is. Genesis 1, beginning in verse 26, says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And we know that in the Hebrew is Elohim. It means more than one. Plural. It's the God family made up today of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 
continues on and says, And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and upon every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, there with the Father, creating. Excuse me one second. Matt. I had a feeling I'd get up here and they'd really get rolling at some point. Quick time out. If I could only blot that from the tape. Let's turn, brethren, to John 1, and let's refresh ourselves with some scriptures regarding Jesus Christ. We try to really understand the depth of God's love. Because I think sometimes we forget just how much was on the line. How much was at stake? John 1, beginning in verse 1, says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. This is referring to Jesus Christ. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of of men. And when we have God's Spirit, that light of Almighty God is within us. We're supposed to let it shine. We're supposed to let it shine in the darkness and not hide it under a basket. How do we do that? By acting like our Lord and Savior. By loving others as He has loved us. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And of course, John was the forerunner, that voice in the wilderness. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, that true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Every man in his own order, according to God's purpose, that light, that calling will go out to. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And most of the world today does not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. He gave you the right, brethren, if the shed blood of Jesus Christ is upon you and the Spirit of Almighty God is within you, he gave you the right to become his children. To those who believe in his name, and it's more than believe, it's commit, those that commit to him who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of any man, but of God. It was the Father that called us. No man can come to Jesus Christ unless the Father draw him. John 6, 44. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. There's only one begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ. And He was full of grace and truth. That's the Savior. That's the one that gave His life for you. Just a couple verses in uh, Hebrews chapter 1. It reiterates who Christ is. Beginning in verse 1 of Hebrews 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, 
whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. And this reiterates just what we read in John 1. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. He is the express image of the Father. They are of the same mind, of the same thoughts, of the same will, of the same goals and the same objectives. Can two walk together lest they be agreed? The Father and the Son are in total agreement, and they are the express image of one another. And upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, and that's referring to the Father, did the Father ever say to one of the angels, You are my Son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a Father, and he shall to be, be to me a Son. This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God, and the co-creator of this vast universe, with the Father. This universe, they have no idea where it ends. Only God knows. They look out the Hubble telescope. That's an awesome, awesome uh, invention. I just love to look at the pictures and I just meditate and think. And it's like God's glory. There, there's not words to give God the glory that He deserves. There's not words, brethren. God is so good. Jesus Christ gave up His divinity. He gave up all power. He put it aside and said, I will go. I will make a way that we can reconcile mankind. Because the breach. And the breach is sin. And sin brings the death penalty. He gave up all power. And when he became a man, had he sinned, the son would have been lost forever because he would be condemned as well. And there would be no Savior. Some think that I, it, it's just automatic. Christ just went through the motions, you know, there wasn't anything. He just came and, okay, you know, he lived as a man and he was beaten and, and died. There is so much depth to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, to Him giving up all powers I mentioned, and having to live a life. If He'd made one mistake, it would have been over. It would have been over, and we wouldn't have a Savior. You wouldn't have the promise of eternal life that you have today, that you can hold on to, that you can hang on to, that Jesus Christ said, I go to prepare a place for you that you may be with me someday. I know the older I get, the more I look forward and not backward. And I'm thankful for that because we need to look forward. Because forward is what we have promised. Just as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Sarah, and so many before us, they looked forward as we read about Hebrews 11. And through so many scriptures, they looked forward and they pressed on. They pressed on and they held on to the faith once delivered. And they held on to those promises because they know that God is a God of truth and He's a God of His Word. And He backs up every word that He makes. God the Father, brethren, could have lost His Son forever. His Son that was with Him for countless millennia, we don't know how long. God says we can't understand heavenly or earthly things. How can He explain the heavenly? There will be a time. It's immaterial. His Son was with Him. They co-created the worlds, just as we read. And He could have lost His Son forever. And this is a Son that's the express image of His Father. They are of, as I mentioned, one mind in one way. 
Let's turn to Matthew chapter 4. As I mentioned, this is very serious. And Christ put everything on the line, everything on the line for each and every one of us. Matthew 4, beginning in verse 1. This, of course, is referring to the temptation of Jesus Christ. Why would Satan even tempt him if he didn't think there was uh, some value to it? He knew there was value. He wanted nothing more than to destroy Jesus Christ and the plan of Almighty God to reconcile mankind to himself. He wanted nothing more than to thwart that. He does not want God's kingdom to come here. He does not want us to have a happy and prosperous life in the kingdom of God. He doesn't want anyone to. He wants all mankind destroyed. And he wants God destroyed. He tried once, he'll try again. And he's going to deceive, as Revelation says, as the sand of the sea after that thousand years, he's going to go up and deceive the nations again. That's another whole subject. But it shows just how much power and influence Satan has on mankind. It's something we have to take very serious. Our calling is very serious. Do we truly want to be the children of Almighty God? Beginning in verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. I cannot imagine. Jesus had to have been a strong man. A strong man. 40 days and 40 nights. And now when the tempter came to him, at his weakest moment, at his weakest moment, he's there to set a trap, try to take you in. Just like he took Adam and Eve in. Ah, surely you won't die. Don't believe that. It's not true. It's how he operates. He's the father of lies. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are, he's trying to tempt him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He shall give charge, or give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash a foot against a stone. You don't think Satan knows the Scriptures too? Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil took him up an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. There's two key things that are illustrated here. There's more, but there's two key things illustrated here. One, Satan is truly the God of this world, as 1 Corinthians 4 tells us. Had he not had the authority over all the kingdoms of this earth, how could he offer them to Jesus Christ? You can't offer what you don't have. And number two, Christ's very existence was on the line. The Son of Almighty God could have been in a position to be destroyed. We cannot imagine what the Father went through with His Son and all that Jesus Christ went through. God the Father went through it along with Him. You know, we get a little taste 
with Abraham. If you'll turn back to Genesis chapter 22, you know, go through some of this. As we refresh our minds, Abraham wanted a son so bad. You remember the story and how he was about 100 years old before God blessed him with that son. Genesis 22, beginning in verse 1, says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there. as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you. Can you imagine Abraham's heart just melting? What, Lord, did you say? My son that you gave me, that you promised me, that I love, that I cherish, that I must sacrifice. In verse 2, he says, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. Oh, I read that. I'm sorry. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. I cannot even imagine. He probably couldn't even sleep that night. He was probably under so much stress and trying to understand. I waited all these years and God promised me a son and then he gave me a son, but now it's to take him away. Yet he did it. Yet he had the attitude of Jesus Christ of not my will, but your will. So he trusted God, yet he was hurting. He had to have been hurting completely within himself. And he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. Can you imagine just cutting the wood and thinking about what that wood was for? To burn his son after he was sacrificed. And he rose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Can you imagine Abraham's heart at that moment when his son that loves and trusts him looks at him and asks where this offering is? Where's the lamb? He knew what sacrifice was about. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. That is prophetic. That is a prophecy. God will provide a lamb. Because he knew the lamb that he would provide was his own son. The son that he loves. So the two of them went together, and they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar 
in there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand upon the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. God knew at that moment how much Abraham loved him. This son that he loved, he was willing to trust God and to give it up. For I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord Will Provide, as it is to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Excuse me again. Brethren, God has provided for all of mankind. Every man, woman, and child that have ever walked the face of this earth, God has provided a Redeemer and Savior of the world. The depths of God's love for each of us is immeasurable. You cannot measure the love God has for you. We get down sometimes with life and different things. We have so much to be filled with joy about. It's human nature. It's human nature to let things get to you. You have a promise from Almighty God to be in the kingdom to live as His children forever. You don't know what God has planned for you in the future. It doesn't go beyond. He doesn't tell us beyond because you can't handle it. And it's not time for that. But we have a hope and a promise of His coming kingdom, of a way of life that is designed to bring happiness to all those who will partake in it, who are willing to love God back. You know, Jesus Christ simply said, if you love Me, keep My commandments. He didn't say, I'll beat you over the head to do it. He said, if you love me, I have loved you and I have given all that I have for you. Will you show me love in return? And we show our love by keeping as best we can the commandments of Almighty God. And when we fall short, we go before Him and we repent and we ask His forgiveness and we turn and go the other way. That Passover lamb going back was slain from year to year. It was a shadowy type of the reality which was the Son of Almighty God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Our Messiah, our Savior, the Savior of all mankind. The Lamb was collected on the tenth day, just as Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem on the tenth day, that year that He gave His life, on a colt of a donkey, on the tenth day of the first month. You can find that in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. And I'll just read that quickly, a few verses there. The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast... When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, 
Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Everything he did, it puzzled them. He came as a humble carpenter. He worked hard. He was a light, the light of his father. And he humbly, you know, on a horse, a king comes in on a horse. A king was for war and power. And our humble Savior came and he rode into Jerusalem upon the colt of a donkey. And that lamb, just as Jesus Christ was sacrificed on the 14th day on Passover, he was fully human. He hurt. He felt pain. He knew what he faced, and he felt emotion, the pulls of the flesh. And he prayed, and brethren, it was real. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed. Three times we get the account Think on that for a moment, just how real what every emotion he was going through and how real it was. And what about the Father and what he was going through? He knew it was at the last hour. He knew it was about to happen to his son. Just a couple verses of the account. Matthew 26, verse 39, referring to Christ. And he went a little further and fell on his face and he prayed saying, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Three times he prayed before he was taken into custody that night. I want to bring to our recollection some verses in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we usually go through a lot of these at atonement, which is appropriate, but they're also appropriate for Passover. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, good things, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. You know, God was teaching people through the sacrifices of animals that life is in the blood. And when you sin, there has to be death. And that death would, would be that animal, but it still didn't give you the forgiveness that was all through Jesus Christ. That's what it looked forward to. It pictured. It was a type. It was a shadow. But the reality was Jesus Christ. He says, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then they would have not ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, he says, there is a reminder of sins every year. Just as we're reminded every year at atonement that the blood, there had to have been shed blood. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, this is referring to Jesus Christ, listen to these words. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. To do your will, O God. To do your will, Father. It was written of the Son, Jesus Christ, and what he would do. Verse 8, previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. He is that reality. 
By that will we have been sanctified. You have been set apart, brethren. That word sanctify means set apart. Just as God set apart the Sabbath, He has set apart each one of us for holy use, for His use. We are, as Mark mentioned in his message, we are the temple of the living God. If His Spirit indwells within you, we have to remember that. With that comes responsibility. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Those sacrifices didn't take away sins. They were a reminder. They were a school teacher of death. Death is the punishment for sin. And Jesus Christ died that he may take away our sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, listen to this beautiful words, brethren, because the Father can look upon you because of it. Because of it, you can be his child. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified, those who are set apart. Through Jesus Christ, we are looked at as perfect, even though we fall short of perfection. It's only through him and by his grace, by the love of Almighty God, and by his mighty acts, what he did, just as you look back at physical Israel when God it talks about His outstretched arm and His power and how He led them by a mighty hand and all the miracles that He did. It was by His might. It wasn't by theirs. It's just like our, our saving grace and our life. We're saved through the power of Jesus Christ and what He did. He overcame the tempter. He overcame Satan in every way, shape, and form. And not once did He sin. And He qualified to be our King, our High Priest. And when He's coming back, we long for, we look forward to, because those are the times of true love and life and happiness that this world has never seen, has never known, but it's going to know, because God has a plan. People think God's a shambles and He's losing and, and, and all. He's not. He has a plan. Man has to figure out for himself that His ways are divisive. They're wrong. They bring nothing but unfruitfulness and unhappiness. God's way of life brings happiness and joy and peace and long-suffering. And you'd look at those fruits of the Spirit. Those are the fruits of Almighty God who were to emulate, who were to become like, who were to be filled with His Spirit. Verse 15, he says, But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And God reminds us, doesn't he? We do something, we make a mistake, it hits you. It hits you like a ton of bricks. Why did I do that? Father, please forgive me. I'm sorry, I don't want to be that way. Please give me the strength and help me to become more like you. Help me to be that light and be filled with love and not be grouchy or whatever it might be that, that, that happens in your life that's negative. Verse 17, and he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. You see, that's how God is. God isn't like man. Man says, you know what, you did me wrong. I'm going to forgive you, but I'll never forget it. I will never forget it. I'll go to my grave remembering that was serious what you did to me. But I'm going to forgive you. God's love. He forgives and He wipes it out. It's gone like it never happened. It is washed under the blood of Jesus Christ. And He says, Your lawless deeds I will remember no more. Isn't that... Doesn't that bring comfort to you that you can go before God and pray and not have that on your shoulders and not have that guilt? 
Because God has forgiven you and He's forgotten about it. He says, as far as the east is from the west, I'll blot out your sins. And I'm paraphrasing. Verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness. See, now we can, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can come before the throne of Almighty God boldly. And as you're praying for those on the prayer list, you can come before God boldly and ask Father, uh, God, our Father, to intervene in those people's lives and knowing that He's hearing your words and He understands. And He will intervene. Having boldness to enter the holiest to enter the holiest, that's before the Father, by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is His flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, and having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Be firm in the faith. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let's edify one another. The body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Love one another and uplift one another and edify one another. Stir up those things that bring love and good works. Positive things. And then he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So much more as we draw uh, closer to the return of Christ. We're going to need each other, brethren. We need each other. We are the body. Christ is the head. I want to go through just a few more verses as we bring this to close. In 1 Peter chapter 1, if you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, like I said, there's so many scriptures, so many wonderful words of God. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 17, says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges, God is not partial, He's across the board, He doesn't play favorites, without partiality, judges according to each one's work. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. You know, we're here a short time, brethren. Man's days are three score and ten, and if by strength, God will give you ten, or maybe ten more. Some, some live to be ninety, a hundred years old, but God's only given us seventy. If by strength, you'll have more. But my point is, we're here a short time. It passes so very quickly. When we're young, we got life all ahead of us, and we think, boy, you know, you're in your 20s, you're indestructible, and everything's great. You start getting a little older, you get past 50. Maybe even 40s, you start to feel some aches and pains, and you find out how temporary you really are. We are temporary, and we're here a short time. But the shorter time we're here, the closer we are to God and His kingdom. I lost my place. Okay, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You weren't bought with silver or gold, he says. Something that fades away, that's temporary, that doesn't mean a whole lot. From your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. We talked about how precious that blood was. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he was perfect. He never thought even a wrong thought. That's how under control he had his flesh. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. I said it's personal. It's for you. He died for you who through Him believe in God, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> who raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Is that where our faith and hope is? 
That's where it's supposed to be, brethren, in God, in His promises, in that wonderful world tomorrow. Now, I asked at the beginning, and I'll ask you now, does God love you? Has our Heavenly Father in Christ revealed the depth of their love for all mankind? We each need to be assured. Because this is real. This isn't fake. This isn't, you know, you, you come to church each week and we just go on about life. This is real. Salvation is real. God is real, contrary to what most of the world will tell you. God is very real. And so are His promises. And one day, each one of us will stand before Him. As we enter this Passover season, let us meditate and remember the love that God has shown for each and every one of us. Think about how much He loves you, how much He wants you to be a part of His family forever. He's given us everything that we need to overcome. He tells us if we're faithful and we're steadfast and we're true to Him, he will give us all things. And He wants nothing more. There's a scripture that comes to mind. It's His joy to give you the kingdom. It's the joy of Almighty God to give you the kingdom. You think about the best gift you could give one of your children, something they've wanted maybe for a long time, whatever, and how happy are you to give that to them? Well, God, our Father in Heaven, and Jesus Christ are happy and filled with joy to give you the kingdom. Think about the life that He's called us into. Think about that. Think about a life of joy, because that's what He's called you into. People may not realize it. God has called us to be filled with joy. He didn't say our pocket books will be full. He didn't say we'd have an easy way. But He said, if you follow Me, I'll fill you with love. I'll fill you with mercy. I'll fill you with goodness. I'll fill you with blessings that will run over that you cannot count. There's so many blessings, brethren, that we have we just take for granted. We talked about our health and just being able to get up, just stand up here today with you. What a blessing. So many things. And God has shown His love for us, not by His words. He showed him by his very actions. And God has called us into a life to be his children for all eternity. In a righteous kingdom that's filled with love and goodness. A beautiful, wondrous universe that we can't even take in the beauty of it, only in a small way. Imagine if you can go out there and look upon it. I was watching a program the other day and the planets and all the things they were showing and the rings of Saturn. and it just, it, 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 There's not words to glorify God. It's so beautiful. You're just in awe, the colors and how He set everything in motion. Look at this earth. We're spinning 5,000 miles an hour and you don't feel like you're going anywhere. It's like an ornament that He set in the sky. And He's got it turning. And it only goes so far, and he has the gravitational forces to keep things in line. And the sun and the moon, we can't take it in. That's the God that loves you so very much that he gave his only begotten son. I want to close with these words in John chapter 10. You remember John chapter 10. There's only one way to the kingdom of Almighty God. There's only one door. And we're going to break into the context. I'm going to start in verse 7. And Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. 
you'll go in and out and find pasture in the kingdom of Almighty God. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And we know who that destroyer is. We've talked about him today. He wants nothing more than for you not to be in the kingdom. He wants you destroyed, which is not what God's plan is for you. It's not why he went through all this. It's not why the Father and the Son sacrificed. They both sacrificed for all of mankind. I'll read verse 10 again. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus Christ says, I have come that you, it says they, I'm saying you because it's personal, that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's what God has for each and every one of us. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And brethren, he gave his life for you. Put your name there. Remember it. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son for your name.